Thank you, Rosie. Thanks, thanks for the very kind words, uh, Adlin. Amazing speech. Uh, thank you all for coming in person on this fine, fine afternoon. Uh, I've been waiting to talk to Loy for a very long time. Uh, you can tell uh, what a man of the world, what a man of the earth. Um, I, let, let's start at the start, Loy, because when you, you buck the trend in terms of entrepreneurship, right? Because most entrepreneurs, they start their journey when they're 20-something, late 20s, mid-20s, early 30s. But you started at a very different time. You were already quite senior in a packaging company, 42 years old. 2005, you decided to quit your job, high salary, high position, and then start the business, which may or may not you realize at the time would become a three billion ringgit company. Can you start about? Can you start at that time frame? What went through your mind at the time? Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here. Um, yeah, I think to to think back, you know, um, in two zero zero five, when I make the decision that finally, you know, after twenty years in uh, packaging working for my boss, former boss uh, family. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, I must admit, because you were quite comfortable. You, you do things that you know, 20 years in packaging, you know all your clients and things like that. And then the purse was good, right? And uh, it's a listed company as well. So I think, I think what led me to really move on, I think the, the main thing was actually uh, because I felt that it's a business that quite hard to sustain because packaging industry, I think in those days, uh, the early days when electronic company was around in Malaysia was quite good. You can imagine how the TV set, you know, mini compos are huge, you know. So those days, you know, I think packaging was quite uh, a good business. And um, towards the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of them start moving out. So I also felt that, you know, a bit hard to keep on to the business, that's one thing. And the other thing is also because it is a very closely knitted family business. Um, I felt that you know when you are private, still not so bad, um, because it's private company, right? You know, um, it's easier to manage. But once you get listed, and then um, you need to jiggle between the family interests and the public and things like that. I find it is even more difficult by then. And that also leads me to think that you know, time for me to move on. And I, and I because. Uh, Somehow, rather, agriculture has already very close to my heart, you know, come, come, coming from a kampong boy, right? So I was thinking that I wanted to do something that, um, to do with food, and then that's how I actually started this, this, this agribusiness. So I think at the point of time, if you ask me, um, will, will I build a company like Farm Fresh? I think it's, it's, it's definitely beyond... beyond uh, yeah, how do you overcome the fear? I mean, 42 years old, you know, quite settled, kids, wife mortgage, car loan, you know, and the great unknown. Was that your first time as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think at the point of time, I think um, uh, when I liquidated, I have a bit of cash. So I think that also gave me a bit of comfort in a sense that, you know, um, you got a bit of cash in hand, right? But to take the gamble, honestly, if now you ask me to think back, it was indeed quite a big gamble because, you know, you already got it and now you're putting it back on something that you have not tested. So I remember my wife was a bit concerned, my sister, they all were saying, God, you know, you sure this is the right thing. Um, but I think I, I, was, uh, I was quite determined in a sense that if I would be able to build a food business, right, you know, anything to do with food, for example, in that case, you know, I was thinking to go in to do this. So I thought if you can build it up, then you build something that is very, very evergreen. That's what I hope, you know, to, to achieve. So I think that because of that, um, we actually started to do this. Um, we bought a small plot of land in Kota Tinggi, Kampung Mawa. Eight, I think you remember 87 acres. That's how we actually start to, started it, yeah. Yeah, you started with the goats. Uh, dragon fruits and arowana fish, right? Yeah, correct. So, so it was like a trial. You, 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 you like to have fish, you like to have goat, you like to have some fruit tree and things like that. That's how we actually started, right? So, but as we goes by, we realized that, you know, particularly the goats, we realized that, you know, it was a very niche product. It was good. But because it's expensive, it's very niche. So we realized that it's very hard to scale. You know, that's, that's how we actually start to look at it. And I realized that because of the um, goat's milk, we actually begin to realize that actually there is quite a big opportunity in the dairy space. And uh, I was quite fortunate in the sense that, you know, uh, across the farm, there's another plot of land, 500 acres was available. 
So because of the acquisition of the land, that gives us a space to actually do dairy, uh, dairy cow. Because uh, goats is different. Goats, you know, they're small animal. You put in a, a barn and things like You don't really require a big... But to do dairy cow, you really need to have a bigger plot of land. So that also kind of like comes along the same time. Then we think that, you know... So by then, my mind was quite sad. Dairy is the way to go. And what we did is that we start to say, and the arowana was having a boom in Bukit Merah. You know, everybody was chasing arowana, so so we sold we sold all our arowana away, and then the fish become cow lah, just tuka. <laughs> um, around about this time, you called your old friend Azmi, right? And then and then you also raised um, some money because five hundred acres is a lot of uh, it's quite expensive, right? So around about that time, Kazana came in as well. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so I think I think that was the time that you know when we first started, and then uh, I got Azmi to come in to help. So Azmi, it, um, it was my former colleagues from my old friend. He's an old friend. We are going back, you know, more than twenty years old friend, right? So I told Azmi to come in to help me. So Azmi, in charge of marketing, you know, uh, in KL in the early days was really tough. You know that um, that uh, how you started with sixty cows and you got a few hundred liters of milk. How do you send to KL, for example? So the early years was really um, it's hard to even today. I think about it. You know, I think it's very daunting, right? You know, you have the milk that you process. Now you have to send it to supermarket, and KL is a market you can't ignore, and you cannot send using a chill truck one ton or three ton chill truck ferrying the few hundred liters of milk. You know, you can't even enough to recover your toll and your expense. So we send by bus express, put in the polyfoam, as me were collecting in Sungai Basi toll, and then from there on, you know, uh, we, 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 we sell those milk. So it was, it was very, very challenging the earlier year. So, and it was quite fortunate, I think, the Kazana during that time, I think um, I'm very thankful that you know I got in the backing of Kazana. I think at the point of time, I think the government was actually promoting agriculture as a business. And so during that time, you know, I think Kazana has got a portfolio that they actually invest into in this um, uh, 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 agriculture. They think that is of, an, uh, of national interest. So the initial stage, actually, when they invested, they were actually invested to buy a fund. So when the fund closed. We were the only one that make it back to the Kazana proper. And that is where the additional cash injection coming in that we are able to scale uh, uh, during that time. Yeah, yeah so I, I think at today's valuation of 3 billion ringgit, that 30% is worth 900 million. That's, that's not bad going for Kazana. Um, <laughs> um, but what, what were some of the close shaves at the time? Because I'm sure it was an all smooth sailing, right? Um, you know, obviously Malaysia is not a nation of milk consumers, not like Australia is. It's expensive, seen as a luxury item even, right? Um, even babies, they don't drink fresh milk, they drink infant. We'll talk about that in a few okay. minutes, right? Um, must have been very difficult. How, how bad, how tough was it in those early days? I think when we first started um, to go into the supermarket, I think the biggest challenge then was that, you know, because the multinational brand has been there for the longest time, right, you know? And the worst thing is that, you know, uh, just like to quote the Aeon, the Japanese boss was telling me, he said, Loisan, you know, in Malaysia market, anything that you put on chiller, right, is deemed fresh. So it doesn't matter if make from milk powder or make from anything, right? You know, it, the people would think it as fresh. So when you have fresh milk, put it down there. And we were so small, we only had one facing, right, you know, because... If you go, you walk in, you probably can't even find out. Even you want to search for it, you know, you have to really uh, browse through, browse through to until you find a bottle of Farm Fresh down. That was how we actually started. And in the early days, our equipment investment is also not so top notch. So our shelf life was quite short as well, right? You know, it's like, you know, we got about 12 to 14 days shelf life and things. So the moment you place it there, you left about 10 days to go. And within a week, if customer don't spot you, there you are, you know. You need to pull it out on the selling floor and you have to discard it. So that, the early stage, that is why I think Azmi and I spent a lot of time on the selling floor. I, you know, till today, if I go to the selling floor, I will still see, if they don't take farm fresh, I will still say, Auntie, why don't you try this, right? It's, it's, it's in me already, you know. So when you go to the selling floor, we want to promote our product. So I think Azmi and I did that in the early stage. And what we realized that after on weekend i always in giant and um, hey, just go to brow right so we realized that hey you know a lot of repeat customer coming back and then we asked hey auntie oh are you like oh yeah my, my children like your meal and things like so that 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 gives us a real comfort in the sense that you know you have a product that a repeat customer so to anything that you do you can promote 
but customer give you an opportunity to try your product. But by the time when they try, right, they realize, ah, you know, nothing great about it. And then the next time they won't buy and things like that. So I think then it's very hard for you to grow your business. In our case, I think we are able to grow because we know our customer retention is very good. And then once we catch all of them, they tend to stay with us. So the next thing is that ASME and I have to worry about is, it is to scale the uh, product, uh, having more of our fresh milk going to the supermarket. Yeah. Yeah, just like the last episode with Vivi, right? Fashion Valley, building a brand from a small Southeast Asian country is very hard. You know, you're, you're up against the big boys. Um, you know, let's not mention their names, but they're, okay. they're household brands. Been here 100 years, right? What is your advice to companies now, fledgling entrepreneur companies, that want to start a consumer brand that is selling to the mass market? What is your advice to them? Yeah, I think in today's... Um brand, right? I think um, the consumer expectation, I think, is, 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 is you cannot take them for granted anymore, right? And they, are, they are, are, are very, very demanding as well, right? So I think to build a brand that truly um, a consumer loves you for, for, for your value, I think number one, your value has to be right. So in a way that, you know, if you were to market any product, your, I think your value in a sense that you place the customer well-being, the customer uh, uh, interest as, as your core value. I think that is very, very important because if you don't do that, right, I think it's very hard to keep the band promises because I, th I think over the years I've seen a lot of brands that, you know, that, uh, that started well and over the years for whatever reason, right, you know, they depart from the brand promises, maybe the cost pressure, maybe for whatever reason it is, right. So once you sway from that, you would, you, it's a matter of time you will catch up with you in a sense that the, the customer who supported you for the value, five years later, ten years later, you no longer hold the value. So I think it's very, very hard for you to sustain your brand. So I think that is very important. The ability to keep your brand promises, I think that is the key. You identify what you want to do for your customer and they appreciate you for that. And because of that, you have more and more following and you have more and more customers that you recruit and they stay with you. So it is it, it, common sense you know, to think that you, know, you cannot depart from that, that promise. Okay, let's fast forward to the current era, right? Um, from a, you know, very hard beginnings, 42 years old, left Copper World, don't know what the future is going to hold. 17 years later, you're now MD, CEO uh, of this 3 billion ringgit giant, right? Out of nowhere, 17 years later. But you've also come out, right? Uh, at a time when inflation is one of the highest. In America, it's the highest in maybe 40 years. Okay? Prices everywhere are going up across the board. You have got 30 cornerstone investors, Loy, right? Some of the biggest names in the world are there. You also have quarterly earnings to look out for. Year-on-year year increase, you must increase every quarter. You came out public at 31 times earnings, right? Nestle trades at 51 times, right? Uh, QL trades at about 53 times earnings. They think that you can become bigger than them, which you can because 10 times 3 billion is, is only 30 billion, right? How do you do that? by not increasing your prices because you're trying to create, keep your brand value, your brand promise? I think this is a very interesting question. Um, as I said, you know, before that, we are a private company, right? So you are only accountable to your you know, partners, you know, yourself and your partners, right? So today, going to the marketplace, you know, um, uh, listed ourselves, you know, like what you see, you know, we have the biggest name, all these big institutional investors as our shareholders. The sense of accountability today changed. I, I, I can felt the pressure, right? I can felt the pressure. So on one hand, you know, we have built a company from zero, from scratch, whereby this consumer, this loyal customer that supported us over the last one decade to bring us to where we are today. Now, and then now you transform, you change, you become a PLC, you have another set of these multinational, uh, big fund managers, you know, investing in you. Obviously, their interest is important as well, right? Now, I think to balance between these two, you know, going forward would be a bit delicate for me. I to think about it. Because on one hand, you see, for example, over the last 15 months, our competitors, you know, the big food, you know, they have increased price for, the, for three times already, two years last, last uh, two times last year. And then this February, they increased another round. And we are only one time, you know, uh, during last September. So we are still trailing them uh, in terms of price increase. But obviously, the cost pressure with the inflation rate, you know, the, the disruption to the supply chain, the wars and all this sort of thing, really, really 
we really have a very strong headwind. So if you look at our result, we do have a few percent uh, GP margin compression. That's one thing, right? So to me, um, how would I want to see it? I, I, I really see this as a temporary problem. You know, you know, commodity price as usual, they goes up and they will come down again. They goes up, they come down again. So it's a question of how do you actually mitigate the cost, right? So I think we can absorb to up to a certain point, but if it is becomes so painful, then we will have to push another round of price increase. But if we can manage that, we'll probably try to hold on to it with the hope that because we cannot go around to say that you cut corners, right? Because of the cost pressure, and then you have the fund managers that, you know, demanding you to grow, to have your margin improvement, why, why your margin drop and things like that. You, you, you cannot cut corner and then, you know, as a result, as a consequence of that, your customer quality being compromised, right? The product of your product. So I think we still have to hold on to it. But holding on to it, obviously, will, co will create a margin compression for us. So I think, I, I don't know. I think I will hope that, you know, over the years, I'll be able to convince some of these big funds in the sense that, you know, if you look at it, you invest in us, you look at us, maybe a slightly longer term. Um, because... I think the yak stick here is that as long as you don't lose customer, right? You know, your customer is with you. You know, the brand is getting very, very resilient. You know, people are, are with you. So maybe short term, sometimes you make a little bit less. You know, maybe six months later you will recover. You make you make back and things like. That. So I think it's a bit of balancing. But fund manager being a fund manager, right? I think the analysts are very, very sharp. Um, once you have some margin command. Hey, what happened to this? What happened to that? You know. So, so there are times I, I, I felt sorry for my CFO Cairo. He's oh, so, so stressed out. I say, you know, I say, well, you know, it is, it is, right. So I think to us, I think uh, we were trying to balance out in such a way that their interests need to be taken care of, but we also have to be mindful that you know our customer that we does for such a long time, right? If it is a sh very, very temporary problem, we cannot be just going back a bit, a bit uh, price increase, a bit, a bit price increase. So if you want to go to the market, hey. You cannot tell people you are suffering. You cannot tell people you are not making money. If you are still making 80 million, 100 million a year, right? You cannot be telling, hey, no, no, I, could, I, I, I need to increase the price. I need to increase the price because I just want to keep on to my margin, for example. Yeah, Yeah. so I think according to some reports, your margin is about 21% operating. La. Your rival about 13, 14. So you've got some room. Then you're the number two player in Malaysia, 18%. This is the ready-to-drink market, right? Um, and of course, uh, 18% market share is the only number two in Malaysia. La. Let's not mention the number one, right? Um, so, do you say these cost in increases are temporary, right? So, you can, you can tahan first, right? How much longer do you think you can tahan for? I, I really hope, you know, the war can be quickly resolved. You know, in fact, before the Ukraine war, the, the commodity price is already coming down already. It's already start coming down. Which and commodity prices like, affect you the most? For example, our corn grains, you know our feed costs and things like that, that form of quite a, a big component to our business, right? So when we start to see it's coming down, and then the war, as, you know, it goes up again, and now it's, I think past few weeks, uh, one or two weeks, it just starts to soften again. So it will fluctuate a bit, but we think that, you know, maybe by another two months' time, you know, by June, July, if things are really not uh, getting any better, then we'll probably push on another price increase, maybe another 3 or 5% to mitigate those impact on us. Now, we see it uh, as a cost pressure, but we hope that it, it, will soft, it will come down as quick as it goes up. Yeah. Yeah, of course, corn is what your cows consume, right? The feedstock. Um, you know, like Top Glove, right? Tan Sri Lee Chai, he, um, what he did was to control his rubber product, his rubber supply, he actually went and started growing rubber because he actually was an agriculture guy last time. Does that make sense to you, or do you not want to do that in the future? Uh, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. We can continue to go upstream to, to improve our situations. Right? I think we have regrown a lot of grass in-house. In fact, that's one of the main feed that we wanted to offer to our dairy cow, for example. So the soy meal, the, the, the corn grains, you know, all these, the wheat, you know, these are, these, are, these are commodity. Over the years, I think there are years that we experience very, very cheap. Uh, corn, grain, and soy, and and those farmers probably suffer because they have to sell it so cheap. So we, as a dairy farmer, we benefit. We eat their corn and their their soy meal very cheap. But now it's maybe it's their time already, their season. They make more money. We have to pay them a bit more. So I think it's up and down. I will not be too overly concerned with that. It is a pressure. It is a cost to us. But I think it's really short term, right? You know, it's temporary. But if we think that the cost is really mounting up, we we we. We have the brand uh, pricing power. It's just a question whether we want to push through or we don't want. Yeah. 
Yeah, so one of the reasons why the investors bought your story, even though you came up 31 times earnings, that's quite rich. Lah. Um, and then I think you, you listed at 130 or thereabouts. Then you went up to 186, now you're about 160, 65. So you're holding on to those, uh, to those gains. That, that's a good gain. Um, what are the catalysts for them to buy into you was the fact that you're going to go into the region, right? Not just with the ready-to-drink market, but also to go into an other even bigger market, right? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think for, for our companies, right, I think uh, we are quite different from the rest of the multinational company. You know, people like, you know, say, for example, Dutch Ladies or Nestle, right? They, they are here. And I, I, I let's say, for example, Friesland Campina, right? They also, they're very big in Indonesia. They're big in, in uh, Thailand. They're big in, um, in uh, Philippines, for example. So each country, they have their own operation. So it's very hard for Dutch lady to say that, you know, now I want to expand to Philippines. Now I want to expand to, to, to but that one, they already have the operation down there, right? So, so, so is Nestle, for example. But in our case, it's different. We are a Malaysian company. We are not in those uh, countries yet. So to us, when we want to move to this, if we want to find a good partners and opportunity, so that is a kind of like another uh, big opportunity for us. It's just waiting for us. When do you think that you wanted to go into that, into the, into that market here? Yeah. So I, I, I've always found it, found it like, um, not unfair, but it's um, intriguing that Friesland Campina from Europe, Dutch lady from Europe, of course they've been here nearly 100 years now, huh? I, I would like for a Malaysian company in ASEAN to be able to grow very big in ASEAN, right? So the big catalyst for, for you guys is the infant formula market. Now, infant formula in Malaysia is um, at, at best unhealthy. Very, very sweet. Very, very unhealthy for the babies, right? Talk about the potential of the market in terms of, again, trying to break into, the, into a new product stream. How difficult is it going to be? Yeah, I think I think uh, the formula milk uh, industry is a huge industry. Just in Malaysian context itself, I think it's more than two billion ringgit, two point three billion ringgit. So uh, we haven't really into that space yet. Um, obviously, we identified that as one of the strong catalysts for us to grow and you know, going forward. The reason is that I would take it as a pretty low hanging fruit in a sense that because you are go although they are here for hundred years or eighty years, but today their brand or rather their their product is not as good as you think, right? So the problem is that we are not saying that the milk powders are no good, formula milk is no good. The problem is that the amount of sugar it has in there. So I think and I like to quote Steve Hager, you know, Credit Suisse in one of his reports, he was saying that, hey, in his view, the next big shoe to fall in ESG is sugar. So I, I, I really like that because I feel that, you know, I think over the months, you know, when I was briefing all these five big fund managers, they were asking me about ESG compliance thing, about, about the environment, about the governance, about all these social impacts and what's not, right? So in one of them, a big one in the national big uh, fund, I say, hey, how about the, 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 the social impacts in terms of customer health, right? You know, you guys know there is a lot of sugar problem in the, in, in, in the food chain. Why are we not fixing that, right? So if you let kids at a tender age after the breastfeeding, you know, one, two years old, and that, from that point onward, you're drinking so much of sugar, and when you grow up, you can imagine the health implication that they have. So I think what we wanted to do that when we come out with our product, we hope that that will be a good opportunity. Nothing rocket science. We are not creating a, 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 a super product. Just no sugar. Okay, so here's the thing, right? Let's just, let's just use a, a brand that every one of us knows. Milo. Lah, huh? Milo is super duper sweet. It's supersonic sweet, right? But it's positioned in the advertising market as um, energy for the whole day, right? You can become a champion, right? Uh, it's been very effective. So you guys, you are fundamentals, organic growth, proper, fresh, quality, value, right? This is a marketing game, you know. It's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not a quality game, right? How do you play this game, Lloyd? I, I remember years ago, um, maybe seven, eight years ago, s seven years ago, there's a brand uh, specialist come and say, that, hey, Lloyd, I can help you to build a brand. Um, you know, I'm a branding specialist and things like that. So he take me through his deck, I run through. And halfway through, I noticed some of those brands that he mentioned. I said, hey, these brands are not what they promise, right? This is, this is not what they are, right? They say, yeah, Lloyd, 
Branding is about perception, right? It's how, how, you how you build the perception on these people to make believe. <laughs> After, I mean, he said that, I kind of, oh, gosh, thank you very much. You know, I think I'm not interested. If you ask me today to build a brand that I am not what I am, right, to build a perception, I don't think so I want to do that. So I would rather take a slower path, honest, you know, to, to, to really, if you were to come up with the honest food, be honest food. That's it. That's what I say. Keep to your band promise. And I think consumer will know. It's just a matter of time. This will catch up, right? Rather than splurging, you know, hundreds of millions or, 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 or on advertisement and promoting something you are not. So I think I respect Coca-Cola for that. Coke never one time promote to you that they are healthy drink, you know. It's an indulgence. It's a fun drink, right? They never tell you that your kids drink more Coke, you know, your kids will grow better and things like that because the truth is not like that. But because billions of people drinking Coke, Coke is still doing very well. They don't have to mislead anybody for that. Yeah, it's, it's a very tough one for fund managers to fathom, right? Like, especially for you, you're so focused on quality. It's this whole conundrum between quality and price and value perception. It's all over the industry. Like, for example, in the watch world, uh -huh, in the watch world, a Rolex can sell for 100 times the price of a Seiko. But the Seiko watches are as good as a Rolex. But there's a reason why the margins are stupendous, right? So I'm going to frame this question in the, in, the, in the form of a succession plan. Because you're 59 years old, right? Okay? right? You're not 39, you're not 29, you know? you're 59, right? Succession planning, the next breed that comes along, maybe they're professional managers. Do they, would you allow them to sacrifice the brand promise for margins? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think this is also another interesting question. I think, I think over the years, um, I think La Femme Fresh, for example, I think... Um, we go IPO, I think for, for one primary reason is that, you know, we have institutional investor and then uh, after decades with us, you know, some of them need to have an exit route, you know, so IPO was naturally a, 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 a good plan for that, right? Now, having listed now, you have um, all the other big funds are investing into you again. I think the expectations are there and I think that for Farm Fresh, um, I don't quite really believe in family business, right? You know, run by your children. If they're not up to the mark, you can't, you can't do that. You know, that was the experience I learned from my former company. So to me, I think it is good that you, meet, you must, the company must be run, you know, with very high integrity, with people that are really, really of high caliber. Because we are not competing with small fry, right? All our competitors are big giant. So you've got to have really a very, very strong team that each and every one of them are very, very good in the, in the departments that they're running. So I think that will continue to be. With regards to value, right? You know, a, a founder started a company, you know, whatever you want to call it, a founder mentalities and what's not, the value, right? I think if I'm around, <laughs> for continue to be around, those value will make sure that I am, you know, very, very, you know, uh, um, uh, hold that very, very tight to me, you know. So if a day, for example, for whatever reason, the company outgrow myself and things like that, now I, know my, I think the ability for the team, you know, not to depart from the brand promise, I think is very, very important. So the next succession in terms of how would it be, right, I think it's very important because if you, if the, the moment you start to not keep into your brand promises, it's, yeah, you get some short-term game, but over the longer period, you will catch up with you. Yeah, so I want to get into your head in terms of why you went public, right, Lloyd? Because when you're running a very profitable business, a lot of Chinamen, they don't list the company, right? They don't want the scrutiny of a quarterly earnings. They don't want the scrutiny of people like me asking questions all the time, you know? People in <laughs> public galleries, it's all very new, one, right? Um, why did you list? Do you think it was a good idea to do that? And do you think that um, advice, lah, advice to entrepreneurs, everybody wants to consider the exit at some point in time, whether to another competitor or whether to the public markets, right? Talk about the whole thinking behind the going listing process. I think um, for us going listed, being listed, I think um, the, my, my, my number one consideration was Kazana because I think they are with me, they have backed me up for more than the decades, right? So I think it's only rightful, you know, um, they have got given the opportunity to monetize some of their gain. That's number one. And number two, we are also growing at a very fast rate. And unfortunately, dairy industry may be upstream or midstream, right? It's very capital intensive. So, so and, I, and I've gone through 97, right? I've gone through 97 with my former company. I've seen how, you know, well-run company doing well. And because of those uh, 
uh, loan mismatch, for example, right? A lot of them tank, you know, 98, 97, you can see, you know, it's really, really hurting. So I'm very, I'm a bit uh, nervous to high gearing. Uh, that's one thing that, you know, um, uh, that I, 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 when I saw what happened, you know, in the past, very good company tank, because just because of cash flow mismatch, right? So I was quite careful on that. So I think to go IPO, that enable the company to raise money, that be able to grow further from there on. I think that is also an added advantage that I, I think a company should be positioned that for because you are into a very high growth area of business that you're growing. So I think that's one of the main, main uh, consideration for me, the two of them, yeah. Yeah, okay, so your partners and of course your market. But the thing is, you are now facing investors who are born into you, into your growth plan. And Malaysia with 32 million people is not a growth plan, right? The region is a growth plan. Indonesia, 270 million people is a growth plan. Philippines, 90 million people is a growth plan. Con milk consumption in those markets, small, high potential. That's going to be expensive. How are you going to navigate that? So I think the, the Australian investment is very important uh, for us because you know Australia being um, a football of high quality um, uh, uh, producing food producing country, right? So we will continue to invest in Australia to ensure that you know that Malaysian gotten all the necessary fresh ingredients support from 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 Australia to grow. Because however much we grow our farm, we can't keep up to the demand in Malaysia, right? So there's one thing, and then you know places like Philippines today. I think if you go to their supermarket, you probably can't find much fresh milk, as in fresh milk. Even even their supermarkets are very very high end. If you look at SM Pure Goals and all this, their their supermarket quality is just like Jaya Grocer or or Cold Storage is very very high end. But there is no fresh milk inside there. So I think places like this, when we go in there, we realize that if we are there. Uh, subject that we can find some very good partners, for example. And I think that, you know, like what you rightly say, Malaysia, you've got 30 million people. they got 90 million. Indonesia, you've got 250 million. So if you're into that space, right, the more, I mean, we know dairy fairly well, right? We know where it's a growth opportunities. We know, you know, how to position the product. But I think being in a foreign country, it's still a foreign country, right? It's not like Malaysia. I have Kazana here. Anything I can write, I can cry to Kazana. Hey, 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 they can help me and things like that. But when you're in a different foreign country, so I think to the ability to find good partners, I think is very, very important for us to grow. So you'll produce in Australia, then you'll export into the region, then you'll have the stamp of made in Australia on the on the box. We down. can have both. We you can have both. both. We can make uh, our Australia. I think next year we we'll go downstream to actually produce a finished product. And that can be exported to the region, or primarily now is more as ingredient, you know, to to ship back. Yeah. So, for advice to entrepreneurs who are trying to regionalize their business, right? How do you do it? What is the regionalization strategy? Strategy, regionalize it, regional strategy, right? Um, it's it's expensive because your cost in Australia is three point two to to the ringgit, and you're reporting in ringgit, right? Your cost is in Australian dollars. And then when you go to the Philippines, it's, it's quite a way away, right? How, how, do you do, how are you going to do it? I, I think Australia, in our case, is that when we first started Australia, it's more for genetic purposes. You know, uh, as some of you know that you know, our dairy breed in Malaysia is actually from our Australian farm. So the genetic um, breeding in Australia farm is very important because the AFS breed that we do, we need to breed there and then we send back. So for that reason, we actually started in Australia by owning a farm. So we bought a farm and then we bought another farm. So over the years, because we have grown so big, right, uh, we have become so reliant on Australian ingredients. We were buying from one or two suppliers and it become a risk as well in the sense that you're over dependent on that particular supply. So what we did is that, you know, since we are already there, I have a great partner, Adam has been a great partner to me. Um, so. So having Adam down there, what we did is that then we actually go downstream to have our own processing plant today. You know, we are 100% self-sufficient that Australian ingredient all sent back to Malaysia to enable us to grow. So that investment in Australia is more on strategic reason to ensure that you know, it fits our growth uh, plan in, in this part of the world. So for, 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 for Philippines and for Indonesia, those are the market where you've got over 400, 350, 400 million people, right? What's the strategy to get there? I think we will probably, the immediate one we probably will go is Manila. 
uh, as I said, they, they don't even have fresh milk down there. So um, now the border opened up, we are able to travel. So I hope that I can be back to Manila soon, you know, to identify some site and things like that. We will probably start with fresh category. So in, in our dairy business today, if you look at it, we've got two pillars. One is the fresh category, the chill. You need to mostly go to the modern trade. And then we have the UHD, which is ambient. You don't have to keep in a chill, right? So uh, for me, I think the opportunity in places like Manila is the chill category, the fresh category, you know, to into the Horeca market or into the modern trade and things like that. So I think that is where we are able to niche ourselves up, just like how we actually started in Malaysia. The first seven years of our growth, we are basically only in modern trade. We, are, we don't have UHG. Our UHG meal is only... Only three years ago, we started, yeah. Okay, then Indonesia, how, how are you going to tackle that? Yeah, we will look out. I think the model will still very much be the same. We want to be there on the fresh category to build our, uh, to build our business. And then, I mean, just like Jakarta alone, almost 20 over million people around. You don't have to look far. Just focus on, on Jakarta and send in the ingredient from Australia because we are, it's not easy for us to own farm in those places. The, the, the national land codes, you know, in Philippines or Indonesia for foreigners to own land is almost impossible. So it's very, very hard. So we are not looking at, you know, a, a, a fully integrated version like Malaysia from farming all the way down to, to processing. There, I think it's basically a processing plant, bring in the ingredient, build the brand and serve the premium market. Okay, let's, let's get into something which is very, very current, right? The whole ESG movement, the environment, the social element, and the governance element, right? The way you tackle these issues, and the better you are qualitatively at these issues, the more attractive you become to those big fund managers, right? The Black Rocks and the Templetons of this world. Um, you, talked, you touched upon this with your health element, with the, um, with the brand promise to children, with your infant, infant formula. Uh, how are you addressing ESG uh, considerations for institutional fund managers as you go forward? Yeah, I think we are very, very uh, mindful about the ESG aspect of the business. So if you, if you look at it, I think in our, in our prospectus, we are probably the first company to voluntarily you know, uh, put in a report with regards to how we view ESG. There are many companies talking about net zero, this, that, you know, I'm not sure how they do it, you know, but they don't quantify it, right? So in our case, we are very transparent. We've got nothing to hide. We actually brought in a consultant, run through all our emissions, and today, you know, based on the report, we are emitting about 46,000 tons of CO2 a year. So that is our number, because we tell you what number we have, right? Being this is basically the cow's yeah. poo, no, right? No, the, the entire chain, the, the including methane. our processing, including, including our supply chain and all this. So it's a complete audit, right? So we paid, we get them to come in, and now we know this number. So we consciously now to make a commitment we are also a signatory to uh, the, the net zero dairy farming, you know, in in, in uh, organization, and we, what we did is that now we say that you know out of this forty six thousand ton, we're going to do work consciously over the next five years to bring down a twenty five percent of our emission. So we did like you know, like all our dairy shed now in Moazam, you know, we are installing. We spent about six million ringgit to install all the solar panel to generate the electricity to to use in our fan, you know, to cool our cow in our barn, for example. Now, I think um, over the next few months, we're putting out methane gas uh, plant to trap the gas, convert that into a methane gas, and then gas, gas will fire our boilers and things like that. So I think it is something that we are doing it tangibly rather than just tell you, hey, I'm going to go net zero. Lah. I'm going to go net zero which year, which year. So how you want to do it? I think, I think what we did is that we are very mindful. And I think that in terms of farm, the welfare of the workers. It's not just the emission, right? It's, it's how you treat people, the, 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 the employees with you, the people that you have, how do you treat them, right? And not only that, I mean, how about cow? We are very proud. We are the first dairy company in Asia to, to get accreditation as certified human by US organization. First one, right? So that tells you that we also care for the animal welfare to ensure that you know, they're well taken care of and things like that. So there are many parts of ESG. Social impact. Today, we are able to create what two thousand hour opportunity for all these home dealers. You know, selling some simple business, very honest business, just susu, right, to your neighbor and things like make eight hundred ringgit, thousand five, two thousand. Some of them even make five thousand. You know, so 
how you impact someone's life in such a positive manner through your business chain without, you know, government have to, waiting for government to send you the brim by 100, 1,000, This is recurring. And because our brand customer retention rate is very high, therefore, they are able, it's not like selling you a Tupperware, right? Selling you a Tupperware, a Tupperware, you have to wait for another one year before you repeat it all. This one is like you supply this week, two weeks later, they will call back and then you, you supply again. It becomes sustainable. That's how actually how we interpret it. Yeah. And then what about the, on the labour side? Labour is notoriously difficult to get. Licences are very, very expensive. Lots of bureaucracy, lots of middlemen, right? Um, how are you solving the labour issue? Yeah, I think, thank God, we are also very rural-based. Let's say, for example, our Muazam Shah, you know, our Taiping Pondo Tanjong and all these other things. So, except with exception of our Lakin factory is right in Johor Bahru town. That one, we have a bit of cost uh, pressure in terms of to, to get the local people to work for us. But in the case of Muazam, we are doing fine. So if you look at that, I think we have almost 90% of our workforce is local. So we are only dependent, like 10% dependent on foreign workers. That is like, there are some jobs local people just can't do it. Like for example, your milking, right? Milking station. Get out at 5 a.m., start milking at 6, finish at 10, 11 a.m., then you go back to rest evening by 5 p.m., you come out again, you finish at night. So a lot of local can't hang on to that kind of job. So we still need some foreign labor for those tough jobs for them to keep us going, for example. So overall, we are not that dependent, but of course, we you know, uh, as we grow, we, we, we hope we can get you know a, a bit of a more foreign worker. Yeah, yeah so that's going to be an issue, lah. just in terms of having the scale with people. Um, just by the sound of it, you do quite a lot. You do more than offset. You actually reduce your footprint. You've got a target within what, seven years to reduce your emissions by 25%. Um, you do a lot on the social side, on the worker side. How does all these activities, Loy, translate into um, shareholder value, right? Um, into more foreign funds buying into you, driving up evaluation, driving up your, your visibility on the big funds. Because at the end of the day, 3 billion ringgit is, on, is only... La, only Right, it's massive in Malaysia, but it's only six hundred million US dollars. Right, I asked this thing of of CY of Yinsen because he's thirteen billion. Right, only about four, uh, three, four billion US dollars, tiny nowadays. Like, Apple is two point nine trillion, Tesla is over a trillion. Right, even the small tech companies are hundred billion, two hundred billion, seventy billion. Right, how is Malaysia going to go into those territory? Does ESG help you do this? Now I think uh, you rightly say you know even at three billions in the in the, in the, in the investment community is still a very very small company. I think what I hope to build this company that I I I really hope that the fund managers will look at us beyond just our numbers right beyond our numbers. I think in terms of our value of the company, I think that is very important how we treat people how we actually look after the customer health, you know, the animal welfare, all these things I think should add up, not just our quarterly numbers, right? Because if you are so engrossed on with quarterly numbers, chances that you will probably not appreciate this as much as you should, right? So we hope we build a company that, just like, you know, the Malaysian love us for our value, a lot of mamas and all these appreciate us, you know, that means to be there for all year in, year out. So we hope the fund manager will also adopt the kind of uh, loving, you know, of fun fresh. You know, it is a great company. You know, they really look after their people. Look at, you know, they, they, they really care for earth and things. What's not, you know? So I think you have to look at the company in totality in terms of how, not just making money, right? You can make, I mean, there are many companies make tons of money, right? But if you can make a lot of money and you're being irresponsible, you don't, you, you, you're not responsible. Then again, do you reward a company like that? Or do you appreciate company like that, right? So I think this is something that ECO, it has, the investment community has the mean to raise the bar to actually get all these business people to behave in an in a, in a ethical manner that you know, all these things count. It's not just churning the company with growth and profit. Yeah, yeah but that's the thing, is it, Loy? There's only one language that is spoken in the world of finance, and that's money, right? Numbers, returns, year-on-year -year earnings, quarterly improvements. So my next question is, right, how has life as a listed company been for you? Has it been good? Has it been average? Or has it been, you know, less than optimal? 
No, I think I think uh, what I'm trying to say just now also in a sense that when 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 doing good itself, I think obviously the company also have to do well, right? You know, it's not what I'm trying to say. It's not just a numbers game. You know, that you grow, you make money, and that is considered good. Really, I think there's a lot of other elements that you need to add in. So, being a listed company today, if you ask me, I think how I feel. Uh, this this the question Vivi Yusuf just asked me. You know, the 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 next day when I got listed, Loyal, how do you feel, uh? <laughs> So, so I, I, I think that, uh, thank God, you know, um, that um, our company did well uh, uh, in the IPO, not withstanding the facts that, you know, the market was very shaky, Ukraine was ongoing and things like that. And there's a lot of pressure. So I think, I think the, uh, the, the endorsement the market had given to us, I think indeed, you know, really kind of make us relief in a sense that, wow, you know, at least not so bad. You know, um, the market still vindicated us and things like that. So I think, I think from the from the personal standpoint, I felt that you know um, it is indeed a, a great ad, uh, endorsement to the entire teams, right? You know, we have worked very hard over the last 10, 12 years. The farm team, you know, and 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 the processing teams and things. Like, everyone, I think, is quite delighted in the sense that you know all our employees are are super excited. Yeah. Was the pressure to list there? And okay, this is not my question. Uh, this is. Uh, Isa asking from Zoom, okay. Maybe not, maybe not the question. How much pre did the pressure to list become greater as the years went by? I think the pressure to list, I, I wouldn't felt the pressure. In fact, we were quite ready to list many years ago already, right? I, I think our numbers itself, if you're talking about three, four years ago, we already meet the numbers, the BAM numbers, for example. But obviously, we are not in a hurry at that point of time. Uh, Kazana is of the view that the company still have a lot of head space. And then um, we also position in such a way that you know we wanted to take the company to a certain level before we actually take it to the market. So it is not that just in a hurry to lease and things like that. So I think that one wasn't really a, a, a pressure that mounts out. It's more like it's quite calibrated in that sense. Yeah. Plan, it was properly planned. Yeah. Okay, so just advice to uh, to invest to entrepreneurs lah, um, who are on the verge of listing or are thinking of listing. So obviously, you've got your quarterly earnings to watch out for and all those expectations. You've got to also th think about your new markets and all those uh, expectations and and delivering all those expectations. But what about the other skill sets that you must um, start to build? Like for example, doing these kind of events lah. I'm sure that when you're only a loyal on of a small company, you didn't have to meet you know all these people. You know, do Zoom calls and speak to fund managers on a roadshow around the world, right? What other skill sets can you advise in entrepreneurs to, to cultivate to to really attract the best investors? I think I think to me, if you wanted to choose this path of going down to IPO, um, what I learned is that you really need to have a very very strong CFO. I think that is really really important because the workflow for an IPO is just it's just unbelievable. The compliance, uh, all these things, right? It's really, really, it's gonna wear you down, right? And then on one hand, if you are running a company, you know, being an owner or being a CEO, you have to bear in mind, you know, you have an ongoing business that continue to drain you down, right? You know, uh, the strategies, you know, markets and you know, developments, you know, innovations and all. So these are the daily running chores. If you if you're not careful, if you don't have a stronger team to prepare all these IPO paperwork and all, if you drain too much of your time, and it's not like one or two months, right? It's like six nine months period. You know, you have so much of paperwork, and if it suck you up so much, the, there is a risk that you might neglect your main business, and that is very very dangerous. The next thing you realize, oh, you I overlooked this, I overlooked that, I overlooked this. So I think that's very dangerous. So I think in terms of going for IPO, I think you really have to be really ready, and the compliance is something that you cannot take it lightly. If you are not ready, you go you go through, and and then you realize that halfway through, oh, you know. This is not complied. This one is not complied. If it is a minor non-compliance, this one. But if the major one, what will happen is that you will stall, and then time costs build up. You're going to incur a lot of unnecessary costs. What are some of those major hurdles, compliance hurdles? Can you talk about them? About some of them? I think usually for compliance, I think the main one, I think, uh, is the properties that you own. If you are uh, depends on your assets, right? You know, usually the uh, the 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 land titles, you know, 
permits and things like that. For example, like you know, when we were when we were doing all these sort of things, some of it is due to our ignorance. You know, for example, like our gen set, right? You know, um, if, you know, we are in a perishable stock. You know, per, per product, you need to have a gen set spare in case if TMB no supply. You can switch on your genset to protect your freshman. Otherwise, all your freshmen are going to go down the drain. But it's not so simple like just you put a genset there, right? You need licenses. You need you need approval. So all these are the things that you know. When we were doing the business, we wasn't we we, we are not aware of it. Then by the time when you go, you realize, oh gosh, this one need license, that one need license. So it's a lot of work. There's so many other things that you need to look out. Preferably. You know, your internal team must be able to, to, to really know, you know, prepare yourself. So by the time when you take it, uh, when you are going into the workflow, all these things doesn't shackle you, doesn't, doesn't unnecessarily delay your, your, your paperwork, example. Yeah. What about the legal side or, or the accounting side? Do, how, how important are these people as, as the business matures? Yeah, I think account is quite straightforward. If you have big four, you know, people like KPMG, Price or the House, usually those aspects of the business is, is more or less there because they are, they, if, there's, if they can sign off your long form accountant reports, right, usually those are not really a, pro a problem. If there is a qualification, you would have been qualified much earlier, not at that point, right? So I think, you, and lawyer being lawyer, their job is to check out which are the things that not compliance, right? If it's not compliance, they bring it up. They will, Working groups need to address it, whether it's in warrant importance to actually fix it or you actually need to you know, disclose and things like that. So I think that is where that, you know, uh, there's a lot. And in our case, you know, we are also doing international offering. So we got like, what? we got um, three legal firms working on our IPO, right? You know, you have the local, you have the uh, local council, and then you have the international uh, lawyers, and then the four, 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 four legal firm working on it. So you can imagine the amount of compliance you need to go through. Yeah, massive. And very expensive as well. Um, <laughs> so 17 years of, um, only 17 years in our law, only 17 years, and you come to 3 billion, right? Three pieces of, adv of advice to give to an entrepreneur to scale this fast to this size, three pieces. There's a lot of advice. What are the top three? Oh. <clears throat> I think number one, I think um, when you are growing the company at that kind of pace, right? Um, there's one thing I think you must prepare for the long hours. That, that is number one. Because there's no shortcut, right? You know, there's a lot of detail you need to pay attention and then you need to rally the teams and things. So I think the long hours is number one that if you are not prepared. But sometimes <clears throat> I only realize that, you know, we are human beings, you know, we have different seasons in our life. There are certain, you know, uh, times of the years or at your point of life, what is your priorities and things like that. You know, some are people building up your family, some of your children have grown up. So you have different so I think there's no one advice that fits all in a sense that, you know, when you when you when you throttle your company at that kind of growth rate, you can imagine, right? Every six months, business plan change. Every six months, whatever that you plan with your team, <clears throat> that need to be scrapped, another route need to be planned again. So it's like constant. So it's quite draining if you, if you think of it in a sense that, you know, that it, it, it actually burns you down. The other thing, I think for me, over the years, I think um, now that we listed, you know, okay, like you create some very lumpy wealth, right? Um, does really the dollars and cents excite me as much? Um, money is important, obviously. I think, I mean, we all need to have some financial securities, right? So I think that is important. But for me, I think today, if you ask me personally, as in me personally, does the amount of extra numbers in your bank excite me? I think probably not as much. But I think what, what actually sort of like um, pleases me, I, 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 I felt more sense of satisfaction, you know, that I, if I'm able to come up with a product, that I'm able to beat this big food company, uh, compete against them and successfully, you know, take away their market share and correct the wrong, for example. I think those are the things that give me more um, pleasure than, than, than just the monetary point of view. I think the people, right, and then the people, I mean, these are the people who work for you. So the last thing you, you want is that, you make money and your people feel that you know, the boss that tells you orang, you know, for example. So this is where, you know, I felt, you know, that it all has to be, you know, I I was quite um, shocked, you know. When we go for IPO, we were thinking that, hey, you know, 
there is a lot of uh, ping form to give the employees. They are looking forward. Some of them got three lot, five lot, ten lot, for example. Then only I realized that towards the very end, hey, well, a lot of them are able to pick up. You know, some kind of sit lah, some don't have enough money lah, and things like that. So towards the end of it, I think I think I fork out like three three point six million ringgit to 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 buy all the share and then uh, give it to the their their respective department manager. So hopefully by next raya, they all can ask them to sell and then can make the difference. Otherwise, they they would not have opportunity to make the money. Yeah. So the first lesson was be prepared for the hard work, the long hours, right? The second lesson was, um, I think, the perspective that money ain't what it's supposed to be or maybe because the purpose and your purpose is, I think, to, um, to address the, the frailties lah, within the dairy milk uh, business, whatever those might be. What is the third piece of advice? Yeah, the people, I think, uh, it's, it's as I say, that, you know, over the last 10, 12 years, I've seen how hard my team works. I've seen, you know, the, the hours that they put in and things like that. So these are the people so I they think that you all just have to continually hold very, very close to your heart. Because I, without them, right, you know, like my case, for example, you know, I have Jacobs, you know, I have some of my key teams, right, all these, um, uh, the, the people that actually makes the difference to the business. So I think it's very important. So I told Jacobs, you know, we have grown to a size that I can't even reach the downline people, for example, I cannot be possibly talking to individual or that. So there, his ability to communicate with his downline, his executive, his you know all this downward is very important. So I think, I think, if you don't have a good team, uh, it's very very hard for the business to actually you know people feel that there's no sense of why should I work so hard for you. Okay, I've got two more questions before we break for the Q and A from the floor, right? But just um, the sacrifice, right? What kind of sacrifice? I mean, time with your company means less time with your family. Less time with your family also, and also less time for your personal health, right? Because you also have to have a certain amount of energy, right? But you're not going to the gym, maybe you're not eating right, maybe you're eating at 12 midnight because you've been in meetings the whole day, right? Well, what about those issues? I, I think the personal life of it, I think, um, to me, I think different people has got different ability to extend, to, to withstand stress, right? Some people, you know, they are very easily cracked. Um, uh, once you stress that bit, you know, they, they go cabra. I, I think for me, for some reason, I, I kind of strive well on stress. The more I stress, the more I crack, you know. I, I will start to think very hard to actually plan my thing and things like that. So I think it is a different level. So I, I, I was quite fortunate by the time when I started this uh, uh, um, uh, farm fresh, my children are mostly grown up already, right? So I think the pressure on me is a bit uh, better in a sense that I, I don't have to look after, we still got young kids to look after, you know, my wife and things like that. So I think maybe starting at 40 plus, there's a big advantage because your kids have grown up. So I, I can be more devoted, like me and Alice, you know, we are very mobile. And if anyone just pack our bag, boom, we, are, we, we, are, we can be here, we can be there because you don't have to worry about sending your kids tuition, uh, this, attend to this one, attend to that one. So I think that, that itself, I think, um, I felt that, you know, um, taking, taking stress and pressure, I think it's very, very individual, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Loy. Um, it's an amazing story, lah. especially, you know, seeing you with your... I think the principles is what really matters. Doing the right thing by your customers, you know, keeping costs manageable, looking after your people. I'm not sure whether this, your breed of entrepreneur, you know, so many of them, maybe you guys are going to prove us wrong. Um, you know, living, leading a principled business life is very rare. A lot of shysters in this world today. So thank you and uh, amazing, amazing feedback. Um, if we can now, we open...